morning, church. Welcome this morning. We're glad you're here.
Jones. everyone. You can go ahead and have a seat. This morning we want to take some time and we get the opportunity to remember why it is that we even come together, that uh, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus that's made it possible for us to have a relationship with God, a relationship with each other. And so we take a little time here this morning to quiet our hearts and to think of the goodness of God the sacrifice of Christ. There is one particular ceremony from the Old Testament that the Israelites did every year that always sticks out to me as such a, a magnificent picture of the sacrifice of Christ. It's strange to us, but we read about it in Leviticus chapter 16. It says, when the high priest made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present a live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. 
And so every year they saw this symbolically, their sins being transferred onto a goat. It couldn't actually take away their sins. That's why they had to keep on doing it. But what it must have been like to watch that goat disappearing into the wilderness, knowing that once again they had the opportunity to be clean before God. It was just a picture of what the Lord Jesus would do once and perfectly when he became our sin bearer once, taking our sins upon himself, giving himself in sacrifice on the cross, taking our sins away so that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what we remember this morning. We remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And so we're going to have some guys come that will serve our communion elements you don't have to be a member of this church to participate. You need to be a member of Christ's body. And if you're in fellowship with him, he wants you to join in in this time. And so um, we pass the elements, we wait, and then we'll take them all together um, when we're done. But let's pray. Lord Jesus, so, so thankful, so humbled by what you've done for us. Thank you for what you've done perfectly where we didn't have a, a chance apart from you. And so thank you for giving your life. Thank you for taking upon us the sins, or, or upon yourself, the sins of the entire world. And Lord, in this little time that we have this morning where we get to remember your body which was given for us, your blood which was shed, I pray that our hearts would be drawn close, that we would bow and worship before you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
So as the Lord Jesus instituted this time with his disciples initially and left this for our remembrance, Scripture says, on that night when he was betrayed, he first of all took bread, he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this, eat this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. As he shared it with his disciples, he said, This is my blood, which is offered for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, Eternity will not be long enough to give you the thanks that you deserve. But take these simple offerings of our hearts, our lips lifted up to you. Thank you for a simple and yet pointed reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you in your name. Amen.
search for work It couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and treasures of faith Never enough You came along You put me back together Every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, this night
thank you so much this morning for being the one who can and does. And you are a good God who made a way for us through the darkness, through marvelous light, showing us goodness and love, kindness, holiness, friendship. So we thank you this morning. Praise your precious name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You can be seated. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Awesome time, awesome time. Kids can go to Children's Church now. A uh, few announcements for you this morning, just to keep in mind, uh, tomorrow night, guys, you're invited to a barbecue here. That will start at 6.30. It's kind of our kickoff for our fall ministries. Meat will be provided, but please bring a dessert or a side dish. That would be very helpful. So all guys, you're invited out 6.30 tomorrow night. As we get started with fall things going on, remember we've got Sunday school now at 9 o'clock. I know it takes a little bit to adjust your Sunday morning, but uh, off to a great start. And uh, there's stuff for all ages. Also want to remind you that uh, as youth group really kicks off for this fall cornerstone, middle school meets on Wednesday nights, uh, same time as Club 316 at 630. That's for grades 6 through 8. Grades 9 through 12 meet on Sundays from 1 to 3. Is that right? 1 to 3.30. It's in your bulletin anyway. All right, and we really need, I don't know, there's a great, great group of kids that we have every Sunday morning for Children's Church, and we really need some adult helpers. Really need some adult helpers. There's a sign-up sheet out on the uh, table out there in the lobby, and to be honest, a lot of you have just ignored it. <clears throat> we really need some adult helpers for that. So if you can give up a, a time just every so often, it would be so, so much help. So, All right. Well, for those of you that don't know, Scott Langmire is a homegrown kid, gave his heart and life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in missions, and it is a delight to have you back, Scott and share with us this morning. Come on. I'd like to pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your love and for your grace. Father, I know that we've all come here this morning with different things that we've experienced, different expectations, different desires, and I pray that through the power of your spirit, you would speak to us now that you would reveal truths in your words, in your word, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that we would be transformed, and that we would find hope. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. So last summer I had a very interesting experience. Um, for those of you who don't know, I like to go jogging, and I like to wake up early and go jogging. And I woke up about 5 in the morning, and I was jogging, and I was having one of those experiences where you just feel like you're on top of a mountain. I mean, I listened to a sermon, I was listening to worship music, I was praying, and inwardly I was just feeling so ha, on top of the world. I got done jogging, it was still pretty early, and I thought to myself, well, what should I do now? Everybody's still sleeping. So I thought, well, I could be a good husband. I'll go to the grocery store, I'll get some food, and then I'll make some breakfast for my family. So I went to the grocery store, Started walking through the aisles. I, donuts, it's a good option, but not so healthy. Probably not going to get those. Got some blueberries. Got some eggs. Thought it's good to have healthy food, so if I'm not just going to be a good husband and a good dad, I also want to make sure that they're eating well. Got to the checkout. There was a lady before me. Had a huge cart of things, and I started without even noticing, thinking, huh, she probably shouldn't be buying that food right now. Man, she probably should have went jogging with me this morning, actually. She took forever to get everything through, and then she had problems. They had to go check an item, and then she came back, and I was sitting there growing impatient, thinking, man, what is going on? This lady needs to get her life in order. And it was my turn. I took my eggs, took my blueberries. It's time for me to pay. She told me how much it was. I took my card out. Beep! Didn't work. Try it again. Beep. Didn't work. 
And then the lady, who I had just begun to judge, who I just had begun to look down upon, who I thought should probably go jogging with me, who I thought should probably be eating as healthy as me, turned at me, looked me in the eyes and said, oh, I'll pay for you. Beep. She looked me in the eyes and said, God bless you. In that moment, I felt about this big. Here I was. I thought that I was a spiritual giant. I had listened to a sermon. I was praying. I was listening to worship music. But I was looking down on this woman. And God surprised me in a way that I didn't expect and taught me a lesson that morning that I didn't expect. Well, you're probably asking yourself right now, why is he telling this story? But I wonder what kind of expectations you brought this morning. I wonder with, that, with what attitude you're sitting here today. This morning we're going to read a text about people who were taught something by God in a way that they didn't expect. They had certain expectations about how God should work, about how God should respond to a reality in which they were placed. But they came to realize God is God and they are not. They came to realize that his ways are higher than theirs and that he's going to teach them the lessons in the classroom that he places them in just as a good father and a good king would. So I want to invite you to turn to Jeremiah 29. Uh, you can use your phone, you can take out your Bible, whatever works best. Jeremiah 29. It's a pretty well-known passage. And the texts were introduced to people who were living in exile. The background of this passage is that the Babylon, so superpower, is going around and they've conquered nations and they've come to Israel. They've invaded and they've overpowered Jerusalem. And they took Israelites captive and took them back as exiles into Babylon. And when the exiles arrived, they were faced with a hostile, brutal city. They were faced with a situation that they didn't really like. And they found themselves in a place that they didn't want to be. And they asked themselves, how can we live in a society and culture that rejects us? How can we live in a culture that hates us? How can we be in a place that we don't want to be, but now we're here? How can we live? Where's God? What is he doing? You see, the Israelites thought that things should be going one way. They, sh they thought their life should be going left. But all of a sudden, it took a sharp right turn. And I think that there's a lot of parallels for our lives today. You know, I don't know your specific situation. But I'm convinced that God, through his word, has something to say through this incredibly impactful story. So point number one and question number one this morning is, how do you personally understand the life situation you are currently in? So think about where you are today. How did you get there? Who's responsible for where you are today? In your job, with your family, your economical situation? How did you get to where you are today? You see, the Israelites in this passage were in a situation they didn't want to be in. They thought they knew how things should go. And I'm sure as they found themselves in, as exiles in Babylon, they were thinking to themselves, well, back then everything was good. You know, the good old days where everyone worked hard and everything worked the way that I thought before all this crazy mumbo jumbo came up and tried to destroy our culture. And now we're in a place where we don't like how it is. Thinking back, well, back then it was good. They were in a place and they felt like exiles. And then comes the question everyone asks, how did I get here? You know, you wake up one day and you realize life isn't what you expected. Maybe you wake up one day and you have the things you wanted, but you realize they don't feel, fulfill you like you thought that they would. You wake up one day and you realize life isn't what you expected. And this is exactly what the Israelites were experiencing in this moment. But we'll see through this text how a Christian has a unique perspective to see things through a different filter. To see life situations through a different lens. So when we look at this text in Jeremiah 29, you can open it up. I'm not going to read everything. But if I would ask you who's responsible 
for the fact that the Israelites are now living as exiles in Babylon, what would you say? They're in a position they don't want to be in. They're in a reality that's uncomfortable for them. They're facing persecution. They're facing rejection. And now they're in this situation. And who's responsible? When we look at the text, we see in verse 1, it says that Nebuchadnezzar carried the people into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So on one hand, we see it was King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the evil one. He was the one who took these people and he brought them to Babylon, a place they didn't want to be. But in verses 4, in verse 7, and 14, we read something incredible. It says, God did it. Verse 4 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So who did it? Was it Nebuchadnezzar? Was it God? I love that the Bible doesn't give simple answers to complicated realities because the Bible says it was both. On one hand, it was Nebuchadnezzar. He was responsible for the injustice, for the terrible things that had happened. But on the other hand, God never lost control. These verses remind us that the world isn't just random with meaningless actions. The verses remind us, remind us that regardless of how you got to where you are today, it has a purpose. But do you believe it? Regardless of how you landed at where you are today, do you believe that God has a purpose for that reality, for that place where he has put you? You, think, you see, I think it would have been easy for the Israelites to respond with just a victim mentality. To give up and say, well, now we're here. Let's just keep our heads down. Let's just try to get through it. It would have been easy for the Israelites to think, well, God's deserted me. I thought life was going left and now it's went right. God doesn't care. I mean, they saw Jerusalem was destroyed. But we see that in no way was the Lord of all creation defeated. God was still fully in control of their situation. I don't know what your situation looks like today. Maybe you feel abandoned. Maybe you feel like a victim. Maybe you feel like you don't belong. Maybe you feel that your world is falling apart. But like Jeremiah did so many years ago to the exiles living in Babylon, I want to remind you this morning that your reality might look different than what you expected, but God is still there. God is still in control. Just like the Israelites who lived in a situation that wasn't comfortable, that wasn't what they wanted, God is still there. How do you see the situation in which you're living? Do you believe that God has placed you there for a purpose? Question number two and point number two. How do you respond to your life circumstances? You see, I think it's one thing to think correctly, but it's a completely different thing to act correctly. Verse 4 goes on to say, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I love this part. Remember, these are people in an uncomfortable situation. He says, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. You see, the people are in a situation that they don't like. And what does God tell them to do? He says, accept where you are and live fully there in the moment. Live fully there with God. They shouldn't spend their time thinking about an early return. They shouldn't spend their time mindless hours on YouTube looking at crazy videos thinking things are sometime going to change soon. No, he says, be in the place where I have placed you. Be fully in the setting where you are now. He says, grow roots, plant houses. Don't misunderstand me. The people of Israel, Israel were to be the people of God. They were to be set apart. They were to be unique. But he says, settle down and adjust to life in Babylon. He says, I've placed you there for a reason. My question is for you today. 
How do you interact with the world around you? Do you live with a victim mentality? Just waiting for time to pass by? Focusing on how hard life is for you personally? Or do you see the place where God has put you as a place of purpose? As a place of meaning? In verse 7, we see the depth of what it means to live out this reality in which God has placed them. It says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. See, our language, English, doesn't do a really good job of explaining the depth, the profoundness of what God is saying to the Israelites. Because we use the word welfare and then we fill it with our content and think, well, you know, when they're good, then we're good. But the word welfare really means shalom. And it's a deep meaning that's so much more than just good or being well. It means social, economic flourishing. It means spiritually flourishing. It means going above and beyond. I mean, it's, it's fullness. It's completeness. It's wonderful. It, it has depth and meaning. There's, there's success. There's people who have joy. They, they, they enjoy sharing in relationship. And God's telling the people of Israel, I've put you in this place. It's not necessarily where you want to be. They're saying, do you know how profound it is that I'm, I'm giving you meaning? I'm giving you purpose. You see, the majority of us live more with a selfish attitude, Right? We tend to see things through our own lens. I mean, think about the last time you saw yourself in a picture, and it was a group picture. I mean, the first thing you probably did was look for yourself in that picture, and then you thought, well, that don't look so good. I should just hide that picture so no one else can see it. You know, we think first and foremost about ourselves. But here, God's telling them to love the people, love the place, love the city, love the town in which he has placed them. To not live first and foremost for their own profit, for their own gain, but to love others. To love others in the moment that he has placed them. And I wonder if you do this. I wonder if you seek the shalom of Alliance. I wonder if you seek the shalom of Western Nebraska. If you seek the peace, the prosperity, to love others as you love yourself in the place that God has uniquely placed you. You see, the basis of the kingdom of God is not personal advancement. It's not accruing more personal, individual happiness and power, but it's self-denial. It's self-sacrifice. It's serving other people. In other words, it's sacrificial love. It's seeing that God's placed you in a, in a, in a position not for yourself, for the love of others. It's love, period. It's not love, what can I get out of it? Question number three, point number three, where do you place your hope into? You know, when you go to bed at night, what is it that you say, because I have this, I can sleep good? We're going to see in this passage that God gives his people, a wonderful future perspective for that what is to come. And what we think about the future, what we place our hope in is important, right? Because what we think about the future impacts how we live in the present. I mean, think about it. If I would tell Glenn and Debbie that both are going to get the same job, and Glenn's going to get a million dollars, and Debbie's going to get $10,000. But they both have to work this same job for a year. And it's the same horrible working conditions. And every day they got to go to work. Every day they got to do it. Glenn, because he knows at the end he's going to get a million dollars, he's going to jump up in the morning and go to work and have fun. And although it's horrible working conditions, he's going to do it with a passion, with a joy, because he knows what's going to come is going to be awesome. Debbie, on the other hand, is probably not going to like what she's doing. She's going to have a bad attitude. She's going to want it to be over quickly. She's not going to enjoy it. You see, what we think about the future impacts how we live in the present. And now God gives his people a future perspective 
that changes everything. See, the text continues, and it says that the prophets were trying to deceive the people of Israel. They wanted to convince them that they were going to go back faster to Jerusalem. So false prophets came and wanted the people to believe something that simply was not true. They wanted the people of Israel to believe, you know, this difficult life that you have right now, you're going to get out of it quick and you're going to go back to everything that you ever wanted. And the prophets say, that's not true. They say in verse 29.9, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Isn't that like our world today? We find ourselves in a difficult situation. We watch commercials, we hear the news, and everyone says the purpose of your life is to become wealthy, the purpose of your life is to have power, the purpose of your life is to have success in the eyes of the world. And that same message of Jeremiah remains true today. And then the passage goes on. And in verse 10 it says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So think about what he's saying here. The people want to go back to Jerusalem. They want to go back to what's comfortable. They want to go back to what they think is the plan for their lives. They're in a situation they don't want to be in. And now God says you're going to be there for 70 years. 70 years. We can read that from a big perspective and think, well, that's not much. 70 years is a lifetime. He's saying your entire life, you're going to be in a situation that you don't really like. Your entire life, it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's not going to be everything you imagined. And then he goes on. And for me, these are some of the most comforting, profound words in the Bible. And we read them all the time. We put them on our bathroom walls. We put them on napkins, and they encourage us, and they're great. But when I read the context of this verse, it encourages me in such a profound way. He goes on to say, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a hope in the future. You see, God tells his people, I know you might not understand everything, but trust me, my plans are good for you. He says, you might suffer, you might be in a situation that you don't like, you might face challenges, but I have a future for you. I have a hope for you. And this hope it's the same hope that you and I can have today. You see, the message of the gospel is that Jesus came as an exile just like these people. He came into a situation that was probably pretty uncomfortable for him. He suffered his entire life. He paid the price, the ultimate price, of death on a cross. And he rose again so that you, so that I, can have life. You see, the message of the gospel isn't about what I can do. It's about what's been done for you. And so if we hear these words today, if we read this passage and we say, well, I just got to pick myself up from the bootstraps. I got to try to be happier and more faith and somehow it's going to work out. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is Jesus conquered the grave. He paid the price that you and I deserve so that we can have a hope, so that we can have a future. When I see this hope, when I see this future, I realize that the things going on around me, the uncomfortable situations that I prefer not to live in, really don't matter as much when I look into the future. And I know that what I get to look forward to is so much more than just the million dollars and the example I used about Pastor Glenn. It's so much more than what I can ever ask or imagine. And that hope is there for me. That hope is there for you. And so friends, I want to close today asking you personally, not the person before you, not the person behind you or next to you, what do you place your hope in? When you look to the future, what is it?
but you say, well, because I have this, I can be happy. I can rest at peace. If you answer that with anything other than Jesus, I can tell you, you're going to be disappointed. But if you answer that with, my hope is Christ. My hope is the future that he has. And I can guarantee you, no matter what happens around you, no matter how uncomfortable the situation is, that these words that Jeremiah spoke to the Israelites will ring true, not just in your mind, but in the depths of your heart. As you realize that the hope and the future that the Lord has for you is good. I'd like to pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And I know that often we're confronted with situations that we don't like. And it's bad, and it's wrong, and we can call it that. Just as Nebuchadnezzar was not right, but you, Jesus, you, Father, never lost control. And I pray that you help us today see our circumstances with your perspective. I pray that you help us to live in the moment as we selflessly love others, and as we look to the future and grab hold of the hope that only you can give. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you, Jesus, for what you did. I thank you that through the power of your spirit, these words can become real, not just to our minds, but to our hearts. Would they go deep within our hearts today? Would it be a foundation from which we can live and love this world that you so dearly love? In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but now My failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You come my name and I ran out of that grave. The dark.
could rescue My sin was heavy But chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan But you called me a citizen of heaven Welcome home. But you got to actually leave the building. So, I mean, you don't have to. Not right now. Talk to somebody. Make a new friend. <laughs> 